welcome everybody to the April 14th meeting of the IMAG MSM Working Group on Multiscale Modeling and Biopandemics. We have two speakers lined up. Please note that there's been a reversal of the order of the speakers because Javier needs to leave at four. And so we'll do a short talk by Javier, uh, a few questions, and then we'll continue with Natasha's talk uh, and she'll take questions after that. So I hope you'll be able to stay for those discussions. As always, I need to remind you that this talk is live streamed and recorded uh, for archival viewing on YouTube. Reinhardt and myself are always glad to see you. Uh, so are Jim and Lorenzo. We appreciate your feedback. Anything that you need to communicate about the organization of the group, uh, please do let us know. We have our usual communication channels. We really need your help getting the word out. We have a Twitter handle, MSM Viral, that people can use. We have the IMAG MSM page. We have a LinkedIn page. Uh, we have our archive of YouTube videos, which is well over 100 seminars now. Uh, please help us let us know. Um, you could find the links to those uh, easily enough. If people need help with any of these, please contact Jim about it. Again, please follow us on Twitter. Help us retweet our announcements uh, to build the audience that these speakers deserve. Are there any announcements before we begin the seminars today? I need to remind people that we have a steering committee meeting tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. If you think you should be invited and you're not, uh, let us know and we will do our best to get you the invitation for tomorrow morning. Reinhardt, are there any other announcements for this week? Um, no, not on my end. Okay, okay coming up, uh, we have two speakers lined up for April 21st. Uh, two speakers lined up for April 28th. Uh, we don't have anybody so far for the May 5th slot. Uh, so please, as always, make your suggestions for speakers. Uh, we have a number of speakers scheduled over the summer in various slots, uh, but we'd love your assistance for May 5th. Uh, you could suggest yourself, your friends, your students, your postdocs. Uh, if you've speak, spoken before and you have something to update us with, please feel free to volunteer. If you're a member of one of the subgroups and you want to update us on that, that's fine. Uh, if there's somebody that you particularly want to hear, remember that this working group covers a lot of ground. Uh, it could be experimentalists, political, modeling methodologies, uh, regulatory. We've had journalists speak, anybody that you'd like to hear or whose papers you've found interesting recently, Lorenzo is very good about uh, securing our speakers. So please do make your suggestions. So I don't want to take any more time away from our speakers. Again, today, Javier has to leave at four. So we'll have his brief talk, his 15, 20 minute talk first. We'll have 10 minutes of questions after that. And then Natasha will give her talk and we'll have time for questions in the 4 p.m. to 4.30 slot. I don't want to take any more time away from our speaker, so I will turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me to come and present at the working group. Uh, I believe that uh, the idea to invite me was uh, after our uh, modeling work group uh, paper came out uh, uh, last month. Uh, you know, we I was part of a consortium uh, of NIAID funded uh, centers uh, on systems biology of pathogens. And so we had a similar working group where we uh, shared ideas and, and, uh, and concepts. And then we came together to uh, write a perspective paper on models that act on different uh, biological scales that are useful for the study of infectious diseases. Um, 
So uh, what I propose to talk about today is an actual a, a, a part of this modeling of uh, uh, you know processes that are relevant for infectious diseases, which is uh, here at the center of the different scales that we address in that paper, which is uh, how do bacteria in the gut microbiome protect the patient against uh, uh, pathogens that might colonize the intestine and then translocate into the blood. Uh, and we do this uh, by uh, leveraging a large data set that we've collected over the years here at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, we are a cancer center and we have about 200 uh, patients undergoing bone marrow transplantation per year. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a timeline from one of these patients and uh, these are some of the most closely monitored people in the world. Uh, so they come with uh, severe disease like uh, lymphoma or leukemia. Uh, they get chemotherapy that is represented here in this, uh, in these uh, uh, gray uh, rectangles. Uh, and this causes their white blood cell counts to go down. So if you were showing the white blood cell counts and they go down to neutropenic levels here shown in red, and the patients also receive a, a transplant of stem cells from a donor, uh, which, uh, you know, the goal is to replace the hematopoietic system of these patients with uh, a disease-free hematopoietic system. So uh, typically after two weeks or so, we see the white blood cell counts go back to uh, high levels. Uh, but in the period, it goes from, um, uh, you know, the, the, the ablation of the immune system to the uh, point at which we have engraftment of the bone marrow transplant, there's a long period of, of neutropenia that can last several days. The patient is immune compromised during that period. And so we have to give uh, uh, prophylactic antibiotics as shown here, vancomycin, ciprofloxacin. If the patient develops any symptoms of an uh, infectious disease, such as uh, here we have a temperature here, a fever that was caused by uh, Escherichia coli in the, in the blood, so a bloodstream, you know, a systemic infection of Escherichia coli. Uh, the doctors here changed the antibiotic to respond to that uh, rise in temperature that resolved the problem. And what we have on, in addition to all these data that's just collected anyway uh, for the patients as they are hospitalized here for bone marrow transplantation, we added to that, um, microbiome information. So what we do is we collect the feces of these patients and we use uh, microbiome profiling techniques using amplicon sequencing uh, of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. That gives us uh, an idea of which bacteria are present in the feces and how abundant these bacteria are. So here we have, for example, at day one uh, in this timeline, there's a lot of different colors, uh, which basically represents different species of bacteria. So it's a very diverse microbiome for this patient that they want. But as the patient progressed through the antibiotic prophylaxis, we see an expansion here of this red bacterium, the Escherichia coli, which uh, ended up occupying a very uh, significant fraction of the gut microbiota uh, of this patient and was what then caused the systemic infection. Uh, in this particular case, after the systemic infection by E. coli, the doctors changed the antibiotic and that caused the infection to, uh, to improve, uh, but also it caused changes in the gut microbiota. So we see now the E. coli is uh, uh, reduced uh, after the antibiotics changed, and we see an expansion of another bacterium here, Enterococcus fissium, uh, which can also be uh, resistant to antibiotics. Uh, and uh, we see further changes in the microbiome downstream. So what we uh, aim to do when we're starting out is to leverage this type of time series data, these population dynamic data that we get from patients and knowing uh, the different uh, therapies that the patient is going through, uh, we aim to develop meta uh, models, mathematical models of the ecology of the gut microbiome, how these different bacteria compete with each other uh, in the gut and how they respond differently to antibiotic treatments and how that might uh, uh, let us to uh, improve the rational design of antibiotic therapies to reduce risk of uh, bloodstream infections, which you know, for these patients can be life-threatening because they're, they lack uh, proper immunity.
So this is the case, uh, a timeline just for one particular patient. Uh, we have a, a large number of patients in our database. We started collecting microbiome samples uh, back in late 2009, and then we proceeded at a pace uh, that was relatively slow, but steady, and we acquired many, many samples uh, across uh, five, five years. And then in 2016, we got uh, uh, funding from NIAID in the form of a U01 grant that, uh, that allowed us to increase the pace at which we were sequencing our patients. So we were sequencing practically every patient that was getting a bone marrow transplant and practically every stool sample that this patient delivered. So that allows us to increase not only the number of patients, but also the number of patient uh, samples per patient to have practically one per day. Uh, so this allows us to build large atlases of the gut microbiota of uh, these patients. Here I'm showing you a Disney plot, just summarizing uh, a snapshot here of thousands of, of patient samples and showing how they group together in terms of which bacteria are more prevalent in the gut microbiota of these patients. This allows us to, to uh, trace patient trajectories. So a given patient might start somewhere here in this diverse microbiota. That's when the patients come in, they tend to have very diverse, healthy looking microbiota. But as the patient goes through the transplant, they tend to jump around a lot uh, throughout these uh, spaces of possible compositions and often visit these low diversity states where we have dominations by bacteria of a, of a single kind, for example, vancomycin resistant enterococcus. And we also saw that many of these dominated states, these low diversity states, really predispose the patient to uh, bloodstream infections. The bacteria that dominate the gut can then translocate into the blood and cause uh, neutropenic fever and so on. Uh, we also uh, use these data to uh, find an association between the diversity of the gut microbiota at the day that the immune system engrafts. So at the day that the patient regains their immunity, if these patients have a low diversity and microbiome, these patients also tend to have much worse survival, much poorer survival. Uh, and this we did in a, a multi-center study with uh, Duke University, Regensburg in Germany, and Hokkaido in Japan, uh, where we saw the, the same phenomenon across these other geographical reason, regions where patients going through bone marrow transplantation, if we measure their diversity of their gut microbiota at the day that the immune system engrafts, uh, the patients have the lower diversity of their gut microbiota have worse long-term survival. And that's a, a clinical association that's quite strong and, and general. Uh, but we still lack mechanism to understand exactly why this happens, right? Why, why does domination by a certain bacterium at the day that the immune system recovers predisposes the patients uh, to higher mortality? Okay. Uh, we also, you know, in, in these uh, several publications that we published, uh, we uh, applied our data sets to many targeted questions, but we also acknowledged that the data was in a form that was quite difficult to use. So some of those problems are, first of all, that we're talking about longitudinal data that's very rich, has many, many different, um, uh, uh, different uh, types of treatments, and, and it's quite hard to learn this. And we see this even when we have a new lab member joining, it takes at least a couple of months until they get up to speed to the point that they can do some useful research. And that's for people who work together with us and can ask questions every day. So it's even harder for other people in other uh, centers to reuse our data. And, and also we realized that in the several studies that we published, we were uploading data to SRA, to short read archive in batches, which makes it very hard to navigate. And often the data tables that are produced by, by processing these raw data can be even more useful for processing than the actual raw sequencing data. Uh, the clinical metadata is also very, very important, uh, but often when we publish a certain paper, we only include summary tables of the clinical metadata that was used for that particular study. And so without those data, it makes it very hard for others to use our data and make meaningful discoveries. 
So uh, encouraged by the program officers from our NIAID grant, we um, compiled all the data that we had previously published in other studies uh, in the form of a, a, a data uh, registry uh, in this journal scientific data. Uh, and uh, these include all the microbiota population tables and the clinical metadata, and together with analytical codes, uh, it's written in MATLAB, and uh, you know it, it's there for to facilitate anyone who wants to learn how to use our data for questions that we might not have have even thought about ourselves. So those data are there for for anyone who wants to use them. What I'm going to talk about very briefly is one particular study where we use this type of data for a very specific question that we think falls within the realm of reverse translational research, which is what, what, what do I mean by reverse translational research? It means we're going to leverage this vast clinical data set that, that we've acquired to address a fundamental question in science. And that question has to do in how does the gut microbiota influence the dynamics of the, uh, the human immune system. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a testament to the uh, researchers in the microbiome field that it has somewhat been accepted by uh, scientists in general and even mainstream public uh, more widely that the gut microbiota is very important for the health of our immune system. But what we realized when we started out working was that there's actually not that much evidence for why does the gut microbiota influence uh, human immunity. There's lots of experiments done in animal models that are very convincing and, and uh, there's well-established mechanisms, but there's really not, there was really a lack of evidence in, in actual people that the composition of the gut microbiota matters uh, for uh, the dyna dynamics of our immune system. And uh, you know, people have bought into these ideas so strongly that you see people even buying pieces of some stranger on the internet to try to conduct the microbiome uh, transplantation on themselves uh, because they think this might improve their immunity. Uh, so we, we here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we had conducted this uh, pilot study where we uh, harvest the gut microbiota of a patient that's going to go through bone marrow transplantation we freeze it, and then after the patient goes through bone marrow transplantation, if they have not recovered the diversity of the gut microbiota, we give the, their own microbiota back to the patient. So we call this an autologous fecal microbiota transplant, where we use the patient's own pieces to try to reconstitute the gut microbiota after the bone marrow transplantation uh, um, uh, has gone through. Uh, and uh, this works, we, we, we published uh, uh, in, a, in a paper back in um, uh, 2018, uh, the results of our pilot trial. Uh, here's a, an example of for the patient for which this worked the best. We took this microbiota here at day minus 21 before the, the bone marrow transplant. And after the bone marrow transplant, we gave this uh, microbiota back to the patient and we managed to recover the patient's diversity of the microbiome and, and not just diversity, it's actual composition in terms of the actual species that were present before the transplant. So we thought that we could use this, uh, the result of this pilot trial, we have a bunch of um, patients that were in our control arm and patients that were in our treatment arm, and we could compare if the dynamics of the immune system in these patients differed in any way. And what we saw when we uh, uh, compared the patients in the control arm in terms of their neutrophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes dynamics, where the patients received the autologous microbiota transplants, what we saw was a different trajectory of their white blood cells. So we saw that the neutrophils would recover faster. Lymphocytes also have a, a markedly different trajectory uh, in, in the treated patients versus control, and as well for monocytes. And, and then we thought to develop a mathematical model that, was, that would leverage the dynamics in our, in our patient population. And the fact that we have huge number of patients trajectories of neutrophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, and we have the paired microbial compositions for these patients to um, parameterize a model of the interaction between the microbiota and the patient's immune system. 
I'm not going to describe these two plots in in uh, in detail. I'm, this is just to show that there's patients receiving different types of transplants, and our mathematical model also acknowledged for that. Now, at the basis, at the heart of our uh, mathematical modeling is uh, a, a system of differential equations uh, that were developed by ecologists. Uh, it's called the generalized lotka volterra model. Uh, describes pairwise interactions between any number of species in an ecosystem. And, and here, uh, what we're describing is we're using these dynamic equations to describe the dynamics of the patient's immune system. So we treat each of the white blood cell types as a different species. And then we ask how does the dynamics of each of these white blood cell types depends on the other white blood cell types present, uh, but also which drugs the patient has received and also the composition of the gut microbiota. Uh, the way this works in practice is we take the differential equations and we turn them into a linearized form of the difference uh, uh, of the differential equations. And then we, we do a numerical approximation. So we turn the differential equations into a, a difference equation. And this difference equation, then we can parameterize using um, uh, approaches uh, from machine learning, regularized regression for multilinear regression. It's a very, very simple approach. Uh, and the, the regularization just uh, ensures that uh, we reduce the risk of over parameterizing the model. So the response variables in our model are basically the dynamics, the changes of the white blood cells from one day to the next. And what we're going to do is we're gonna model those dynamics as a function of the uh, white blood cells in circulation to understand the ecological interaction among white blood cells themselves. And we're going to use as covariates the drugs that the patient is receiving and the composition of the gut microbiota. And by doing this, we can uh, recover how uh, uh, different drugs, immuno immunomodulatory drugs that are given to bone marrow transplant patients affect each of these types of white blood cells, neutrophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. The strongest effect of all by far is the effect of GCSF, granulocyte colony stimulating factor. This is a drug that is given to the patients exactly to induce a mobilization of the white blood cells from the bone marrow into circulation. And uh, the impact that this has on the dynamics of neutrophils and monocytes especially uh, is, is remarkable, right? So that's of course, we're just recovering a known effect of a drug that's given for that purpose, but it's a testament that our model is working It's a sanity check that we see a huge effect size of GCSF here acting on the, on the neutrophils and to less extent on lymphocytes and monocytes. But this effect is, is very, very strong and it pops up above anything else. What our parameterized model allows us also to infer is the effect of the white blood cells on, on each other. And this it encodes basically the network of ecological interactions between the white blood cells themselves. And then the question that we're, we're aiming at is how do the different uh, types of bacteria in the gut microbiota influence the different white blood cells? And we could recover and quantify those effects uh, using our large population of patients here from Morrison Kettering. So this provides a, a catalog of how the different bacteria uh, in the gut microbiota are influencing neutrophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes among the top bacteria that influence the dynamics of, of uh, neutrophils are Fecalium bacterium, Ruminococcus, and Acarimansia. And it was reassuring that these bacteria had been shown uh, in previous uh, studies in patients looking at responses to uh, immuno cancer immunotherapy uh, that uh, in um, a immunotherapy against melanoma, Fecalium bacterium and Ruminococcus shown as associated to a better response of these patients. And in a, a study that came out in the exact same issue uh, of the journal, this was a, a, a special issue that of, of the journal of science uh, that uh, looked at cancer immunotherapy. Uh, these two papers came back to back. Uh, and uh, there was this other paper that was showing that acarimansia, like you have the genus acarimansia, were associated with better responses uh, to cancer immunotherapy uh, in lung and kidney cancer. Uh, 
And, and there was a, a, a discussion paper that came up in the same issue, uh, confronting the results of these two uh, papers, showing that it's, it's quite intriguing that the gut microbiota will influence uh, the response to immunotherapy, but it was somewhat confusing that different papers were coming out with different genera of bacteria as being important for the response to immunotherapy. And, and, it, and when, when we did our, our study, it was reassuring to find all these bacteria as the important modulators of the immune system, suggesting that they're all important parts of the ecosystem that is important to maintain um, uh, healthy immune dynamics in, in people. Uh, then once we parameterize our model, we could utilize it to uh, uh, make predictions. Uh, and so here we're showing predictions of how uh, 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 the, the dynamics of the neutrophil would improve in a patient if we were capable of modulating their gut microbiota and enriching them in the in the bacteria that, are, uh, that our model determined is the most potent modulators of neutrophil dynamics. And we saw that uh, you know our model predicts that there's uh, uh, an improvement in, in the uh, in the duration of the neutrophil neutropenic period. We would reduce that from about seven days to slightly shorter than, than five days, which would be, could be an important uh, parameter for the recovery of these bone marrow transplantation patients. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, we uh, started out this study by wanting to test the idea that uh, gut microbes influence human immunity, which we thought was widely accepted, but lacking uh, evidence in actual people. Uh, we did this by leveraging uh, 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 our access to bone marrow transplant patients. Uh, bone marrow transplantation is one of the strongest, if not the, the strongest, deliberate perturbation of the human immune system. Uh, and so we used the fact that also antibiotics perturb the gut microbiota. And so by studying the joint dynamics of the immune system and the microbiome enabled the studies of the relationships between these two compartments. Uh, we saw that the effect of the microbes, uh, we detected some effect of the microbes. It is weaker than the effect of non-modulators like GCSF, but uh, on the positive side, it could add to our known uh, tool set of modulators of the immune, uh, human immune system, and the effects could potentially accumulate over time, whereas GCSF is typically uh, uh, given as a dose to boost the levels of neutrophils. Uh, the modulation of the gut microbiota, we speculate, could be uh, a more uh, nuanced way to achieve modulation, but uh, its effects could potentially accumulate over time. So it could add to you know, future therapies that modulate the immune system for uh, to improve immunotherapies. And yeah, so that's what I just said. Okay, so thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. I'll gladly uh, take any questions either about uh, our gut microbiota study or about the, uh, you know, our effort in writing that perspective paper on modeling, whatever you, you, you would like to discuss. Uh, we can take that time now. Okay, we have a time for one or two questions. Unfortunately, the schedule is tight, but definitely we should open the floor up for a question or two after such an interesting talk. Well, I may ask one then, which is, I mean, classically, it's very hard to steer gut microbiota. It's easier to give an immunomodulator than it is usually to, to, to control what happens to the bacterial species in your gut. So, so did you have insights into strategies for, say, increasing back, gut microbial diversity, as an example, uh, that yes. could, could give you give you mm -hmm. a therapeutic approach? Yeah, yeah. So, so the trial that we've done at Sun Kettering is is quite of a, a a rough brute force approach to this, right? Which is we just take the patient's own gut microbiota and then we try to recover it after the bone marrow transplant to just try to recover their own. By doing this trial, though, we've learned a few things about the algebra of mixing different microbiomes. And there's other studies on microbiota transplants that provide more data that we can try to understand this, right? And, and you know, we're still piecing things together. We don't fully understand this algebra, right? So the patient has a, a microbiome at a certain state. We have a, a, a donor microbiome 
and we give the the two of them and we produce a mixture of that that's you know somewhat can be somewhat predicted by the two donors right that we uh, stage combined but it's not entirely we don't fully predict it yet so i i think we, we still need to do a lot of work to understand this algebra fully if we want to take the patient to a certain state we need to know what state the patient is in and then we need to design perhaps a microbiota cocktail that when mixed with the state that the patient is at is going to bring the patient to us to the desired state and so my answer is we don't we don't have that fully yet right it's it's definitely i think it's one of the frontiers but what i can say is that if we are all convinced that the modulating the gut microbiota can influence immune immunity, immunity i think it's it's very hard to predict a future where we don't leverage this right where we don't figure out a way to modulate the microbiota to for for, for the purpose of, of potentiating immunotherapies Maybe we can have you come back and talk about the specific issue because that would be worth a talk on its own, I think. Okay, yes, I um, think it would be a pleasure, yes. Other questions? Usually we have a, a lively audience. I, I, Lorenzo, do you have a question? Yeah, well, thank you for your talk. It was amazing. Uh, my question is, uh, well, you look at the immune system, obviously it's very interesting, etc. Have you just take a glimpse of other things like, uh, I don't know, glucose levels, uh, metabolites, uh, yet that, that you were there, let's say? Yes. Yeah. So, so we have, uh, right. So we have uh, looked at metabolites in circulation. Uh, we have looked at um, uh, lactose in the gut that was important for a particular state of gut domination by enterococcus. So we, we looked at that. Uh, I'll just uh, open a parenthesis here and 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 uh, and discuss a little bit the fact that we're looking at a very special patient population, right? These bone marrow transplant patient population is, you know, the patients are hospitalized. They're going through very severe chemotherapy. They become immune compromised. So the this patient population is perhaps not the ideal to ask questions about the the healthy interface of human microbiome and uh, metabolites in circulation that is important, for example, for weight loss or weight gain or uh, other phenotypes that we know the microbiota is important for. But this patient population, because they're going through such an extreme change in their uh, physio physiological parameters, you know, it, it, it's the questions have to be targeted uh, in, in a way that is mindful of, of that, right? So, so we are acquiring lots of data on these patients, you know, metabolomics in different tissues as, as possible to try to understand better the links between them. Uh, of course, a big question is always what we learn about these patients, how much of that will be translatable into general knowledge of the microbiome? And that's, of course, a question that, you know, it's very dear to me as well. I, I really want to understand that. Okay, well, thank, thank you. I'm afraid that one of the one of the difficulties of this format is that we have to move on. So I want to thank you again for the great talk. I really would love to have you come back and explore some of these topics in more detail. It was a great overview, very stimulating, and I want to thank you again. Uh, we'll now have to move on to our next talk, and Natasha's talk talking about therapeutic sound waves in precision immuno-oncology. And I will turn it over to her. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna go ahead and get my slides pulled up. We'll get started. Can you just please confirm if you can see my slides? They look good, perfect. Thank you so much. So first off, I wanna thank Dr. Glazier for the um, invitation to join this working group. I'm garnering for those of you in the room who are looking at my title right now, you may wonder what therapeutic sound waves uh, have to do with multi-scale modeling and viral pandemics. A lot of the work of my lab focuses on um, immunomodulation and immunotherapy applications. So the previous talk was actually a great preface to what I'll be discussing. And we're working with a nascent technology that I believe or, or submit to you all will be 
quite amenable to multi-scale modeling approaches and uh, techniques in data science as we advance the field. So I would love to garner this group's thoughts on how we can best position ourselves and some of the topic areas I'll talk about to move more into the realm that this working group focuses on. So again, my name is Natasha Shabani. I'm actually a relatively new assistant professor at the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Virginia. And uh, just to outline what I'll be covering in my presentation, we're gonna talk a bit about cancer immunotherapy and I'll introduce focused ultrasound for those who are unfamiliar with the technology. And then I'll discuss very briefly some of the intersections between FOSS and the cancer immunity cycle. And finally, with the time we have remaining, I'll just step through a few brief uh, vignettes relating to immunomodulation, extracellular vesicle modulation and immunotherapy delivery and immunoimaging. And finally, I hope to open up the floor for discussion around uh, future directions and collaborative opportunities. So many of you in this group, and again, by virtue of the great talk that we just heard, are familiar with the promise of cancer immunotherapy. And the general principle is kind of encapsulated by the image that you're looking at here, where with immunotherapies, we often see much more profound and durable responses in the patients who do respond. And this typically leads to more survivals at the conclusion of therapy, owing to the fact that immunotherapy is effectively training your body's own immune system to fight cancer, both locally as well as at distal sites. This is in contrast to targeted therapies where we can often see more survivors at the beginning, but that long-term memory effect is not necessarily preserved to where survival is sustained in a comparable manner. So while cancer immunotherapy is very promising, many of us are familiar with the fact that immunotherapies like checkpoint blockade only extend survival in a subset of cancer patients who happen to respond. And that subset still hovers around about 15 to 40% depending on the type of tumor. Now, there are many hypotheses emerging for why it might be the case that certain patients respond while others don't. But one of the most prevalent hypotheses is basically encapsulated by this figure here, where you can see that uh, in patients that have pre-existing immunity or what we call inflamed tumors, often that can be a positive predictor of response to immunotherapy. Therapy. And that's in contrast to patients that have immunologically ignorant or non inflamed tumors, wherein the pre existing immunity is minimal if absent altogether. The idea behind this is that while patients that have pre existing immunity may respond, not all patients come into the clinic with that baseline. And so there's now emerging evidence for a variety of different combinatorial strategies as being favorable for basically enabling more patients to shift into that category of having inflamed tumors. And one of the combinations that I'd like to talk about today is that using sound waves or focused ultrasound. So again, one of the core missions of my lab and my past research has been to extend the durable benefits of immunotherapy to a broader spectrum of cancer patients as sort of underscored by, the, underscored by that responder, non-responder paradigm that I was talking about. And we hypothesize that therapeutic ultrasound may be a modality that we can use to actually usher more patients into that category of response. And for those who are unfamiliar with what focused ultrasound is, I'm just kind of highlighting here what, how we, most of us traditionally think about ultrasound, which is in the diagnostic setting for imaging purposes. However, ultrasound can also be used for therapy. And what you're seeing here is effectively the curving of the aperture of that ultrasound transducer to actually focus all of the sound waves into a single ellipsoid volume. And it's within this single ellipsoid volume that we can start to see really interesting bio effects. And I'm, in, I'm um, summarizing some of those here. So before I delve into those bio effects, let me just emphasize that within the armamentarium of various uh, therapeutic options that we have available to us in cancer management, focused ultrasound is quite interesting and, and somewhat unique in the sense that there are a few uh, factors that can make it much more comfortable for patients to undergo this treatment and for the actual deployment of the treatment to take place. And this includes the fact that it's fully non-invasive. Most of these systems are designed to, be, to administer the sound waves extracorporeally. It's also completely non-ionizing, 
focused ultrasound has also at the clinical level been shown to be safe and repeatable. And most importantly, for some of the applications I'll be talking about today, it's localized, meaning that we can exert effects at very targeted regions within the body, but without impact to intervening tissues. And so circling back to the bioeffects I was talking about before, I'm just showing some examples here from the review paper that we published a while back. Um, we can do things that range from being mechanical to thermal in nature, and these can include the application of pulsed low intensity sound waves to achieve blood brain and blood tumor barrier disruption. We can increase the amplitude of those sound waves to in turn cause more mechanically disruptive effects to the tissue that would effectively cause fractionation of cells and subcellular organelles. If we now apply those sound waves continuously, as you're seeing in this example here, we can actually allow heat to accumulate within the tissue. And this can lead to thermal ablation. And the examples I'll be talking about today are a partial thermal ablation, where we're basically doing focal treatments within the tumor to achieve coagulative necrosis within the focal region that we're targeting. And we expect, depending on our acoustic exposure conditions, that this will be surrounded by a transition zone of heat-mediated cell death and damage. And finally, if we shrink down the amplitude of those sound waves and decrease the intensity, we can do subablative heating in the form of hyperthermia. Now, these are just a few highlights of what are now several mechanisms of action. So I'm just zooming out to kind of give you a sense for the scope of the field. There are tens of different mechanisms that have now been unveiled for focused ultrasound. And unfortunately, I won't get to talk about all of them today. Uh, in turn, this is also a, just a layout of the global development landscape for focused ultrasound technology. So while I will be discussing mainly very specific applications of cancer, I should say, um, for those who are unfamiliar for, with the technology, I just want to note that there are over 100 clinical indications to date, and you can see them listed here. These range anywhere from the conceptual and preclinical development stages all the way to indications that have been fully FDA approved and are even eligible for U.S. reimbursement. So the field is definitely at a very interesting inflection point, and I'll circle back to why that's so important for the reason that I'm here today. But as I mentioned, much of what we do focuses on applications of focused ultrasound as relates to the cancer immunity cycle. And so this figure that I'm showing here, uh, I will not step through as I typically do for the sake of time. I'm instead just gonna mention that the baseline schematic that we're seeing here is basically how the immune system interfaces with cancer in the traditional way that we think about cancer immunity. However, as we start to intervene on this cycle with focused ultrasound, there are several hypothesized points of intersection that we believe to exist. And as a field, we are broadly making strides to characterize um, the outcomes for these various hypotheses. So just stepping through each of these red arrows briefly, each arrow is going to depict a specific hypothesis that we have for how focused ultrasound may interface with the cancer immunity cycle. And I just finished talking about all these different mechanisms of action that can range from being thermal to mechanical in nature. And certainly this disruption of tumor cells can cause antigen release. And so we hypothesize that focused ultrasound could play a role in not only liberating more antigen, but potentially shifting the profile of that antigen that's available for the immune system to sample. And similarly, we hold the same hypothesis to be true for damage associated molecular patterns or alarmins, which as we know are very important molecules for providing context to the immune system when inciting an innate immune response. Going through the rest of the cycle, we also have hypotheses for the potential modulation of cytokine expression. In fact, there are published studies that have shown that just within the circulation, the application of focused ultrasound to breast tumors can alter the profile of cytokines uh, in patients. And similarly, with the activation of the vasculature, which is a very important step for T cell recruitment, we've seen early signs in the literature that the expression of adhesion molecules on endothelial cells can change as a function of focused ultrasound exposure. And of course, that's yet another um, hypothesis that we hope to continue probing in the future. 
Finally, I think the, the collective elements that I've talked about here uh, render this last hypothesis to be pretty self-explanatory in that, you know, with these thermal and mechanical perturbations, we are effectively trying to lift barriers within the physical tumor microenvironment. And so we hope that the lifting of these barriers can actually increase the accessibility of the tumor microenvironment to the right types of immune cells. And also there are specific ways, as I'll discuss momentarily, that we can actually increase the permeability of the tumor microvasculature to not only different types of cells, but also different types of drugs that may also sensitize the immune micro, the tumor immune microenvironment further. Finally, we hope that we're, we hypothesize that we may be able to incite the right types of cues so that once within the tumor microenvironment, T cells can remain active and proliferate and ultimately exert their cytotoxic effects. So I'm not gonna be speaking to all of these hypotheses today, but I felt for this group that is likely not familiar with focused ultrasound technology, it's important just to emphasize what the broader scope of our field looks like. So with that, I'm gonna step through a few vignettes and the first few are all gonna be related to glioblastoma. And I usually like to start with the clinical problem being that Glioblastomas are the most common and aggressive malignant brain tumor in adults. Despite the current standard of care consisting of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and of course surgical uh, debulking preceding that, um, GBMs typically remain nearly intractable due to the very highly invasive and infiltrative nature within the brain. For this reason, patients face a pretty dismal prognosis with high recurrencies and survival on the order of months. So needless to say, it's a very important problem. And we see focused ultrasound as actually a multi-pronged strategy for potentiating immunotherapy, particularly when it comes to the brain tumor setting. So the first thing that I'm gonna talk about is modulation of cells and subcellular compartments. And before I do that, I just want to impress upon this audience that one of the major barriers when it comes to blood tumors is the fact that we have these physical uh, presences of the blood brain and the blood tumor barriers that actually pose differential local regional delivery challenges. And for the sake of time, I'm just gonna leave this graphic on the slide so you can appreciate the differences in how we define the blood brain barrier and the blood tumor barrier. But with that in mind, we have focused ultrasound now as a tool that can actually allow us to overcome uh, these barriers and circumvent them in a safe and repeatable manner, as I mentioned before. So you may be wondering how this happens, and I hope this animation will shed some light on that. We're looking at a cross section of a capillary. And what you can see here is that we have our uh, immunotherapy, in this case, I just chose a monoclonal antibody that's been administered in the systemic circulation. And we also introduce another agent known as microbubbles. And microbubbles are basically these gas filled um, and they can be lipid shelled or protein shelled or even shelled with synthetic polymers. But in our case, these are albumin shelled bubbles filled with gas and they're on the order of about two to three microns in size. In the presence of an acoustic field, these bubbles actually begin to oscillate. And that oscillation activity, otherwise known as cavitation, can actually result in the transient disruption of the tight junctions that line the endothelium of the BBB, as well as other mechanisms of sonoporation and transcytosis. And taken together, these mechanisms can actually give way to the delivery of our therapeutic into the brain parenchyma. And this has been shown to be the case for a variety of different drugs and drug classes, but today I'm just going to be focusing on um, therapeutic antibodies. But um, this, this has been very well characterized, and while I won't get to talk about the clinical translation today, I'm happy to talk offline about all the clinical applications that have emerged um, just for this mechanism of action. So when we do this in mice, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, here you're looking at axial images of orthotopically implanted glioma tumors on contrast enhanced MR. Hopefully you can appreciate here that with the introduction of a contrast agent known as gadolinium, we can enhance uh, the tumor. We see enhancement of the tumor itself and this helps us overlay a four spot grid of targeted sonications over the tumor. And after that, we typically see an increased volume and intensity of um, enhancement, which suggests to us that we successfully disrupted the blood brain and blood tumor barriers. And basically the set of images you're seeing here are paired for two different peak negative pressures that we evaluated. And hopefully you can appreciate that with increasing pressure, we actually can even resolve in some part that four spot grid that we applied originally.
So all of this is done with a preclinical focused ultrasound system that basically goes into the bore of a large bore clinical magnet. This is at a 3T clinical magnet here at UVA that we use for these applications. And within the system itself, we have a setup something like this where there's a single element 1.1 megahertz transducer that's basically acoustically coupled to the head of a mouse that then undergoes uh, the treatments. And again, I'm happy to answer more questions about our parameters and such uh, offline. But just moving on from that, in this vignette, I basically wanted to emphasize that while we've typically thought about BBB opening in the context of drug and gene delivery, and that is, of course, a very promising avenue, something that really started coming to light over the past several years was the fact that this blood-brain barrier opening regime may not be entirely quiescent with respect to the immune system. So there have been several articles published to date that have basically gone back and forth in this dialogue within our field about the sterile inflammatory effects of blood-brain barrier disruption. And this, of course, has very important implications for the safety of blood-brain barrier disruption in um, certain disease settings where we perhaps do not want an added um, inflammatory component. And a lot of these studies happen to have been conducted in naive brain. However, if we flip that paradigm on its head and now think about inciting immune responses in a tumor setting, this becomes a different question entirely. And we were really interested in understanding whether focused ultrasound mediated barrier opening could actually invoke changes within the tumor immune landscape that could be beneficial to combating gliomas. And so in order to assess this, we basically designed some studies where we were using a syngeneic tumor cell line known as GL261. We implanted these tumor cells and treated them two weeks afterwards with focused ultrasound, as I showed before. And from there, it was um, within one to two weeks that we looked at various um, immunobiological uh, approaches for characterization of the downstream response. And so the, unfortunately, I don't have time to show what is really a wealth of flow cytometry data that we collected, but instead I chose to just graphically summarize some of our findings for those of you who may be interested. And I will say all these findings are published, which is why I felt a little more comfortable skipping over some of the data just to advance a couple other stories as well. But basically our findings were that Focused ultrasound is not only not entirely quiescent within gliomas, but actually there is a time component to the nature of the response that we observe to blood brain barrier opening. In that, in these, uh, in the early time points, so about seven weeks out, we were seeing things like, in, I'm sorry, seven days out, about a week out, we saw things like increase in intratumoral dendritic cells, changes in maturity of those dendritic cells, as denoted by CD86. We saw a decrease in PDL1 and CD155 on non immune cells. And these are important checkpoint ligands that bear their own importance as biomarkers for a potential response to immunotherapy and for progression of the tumor. Also, we saw a corresponding decrease, for instance, in TIGIT, which is, uh, corresponds with CD155. And this was on CD8 positive T cells. So all of these things were, were effectively good signs in terms of how we were inciting immunity within the tumor microenvironment, albeit very modest signs. So the interesting thing is that we didn't really see any signatures that would suggest incitement of a very robust uh, immune response to the gliomas. And this may be unsurprising for some, but of course, this was our hypothesis going in was that we were hoping to kind of see this upregulation of CD8 positive T cells in the micro in the tumor microenvironment consistent with that uh, kind of that axis that I introduced at the beginning with shifting tumors from uh, non-inflamed to inflamed. So nonetheless, we're seeing some really interesting effects here. And as we looked farther out at the more chronic time point, we suddenly saw that some of these signatures were kind of reversed. So interestingly, checkpoint ligands like CD155 actually started in showing an uptick on non-immune cells, tissue expression increased on regulatory T cells, et cetera. And again, all of this is laid out a little more uh, eloquently in our recent JNO paper. And I will say that our characterization really didn't stop there. We've also published two other papers that are sort of looking at these themes, but through a different lens. Um, so immunomodulation in the environment of Brain metastasis of melanoma is another setting that we've looked at and published on recently. And also um, just by happenstance in some of our work, we realized that the role of our onboard anesthesia 
for a lot of these rodent studies was not trivial either. So we basically ended up publishing a separate paper characterizing the impact of anesthesia on um, immunological sequelae and specifically on the transcriptomic response of brains to fuss. So moving on from that, I just want to mention very briefly that we've also looked at glioma-derived extracellular vesicles in the context of FUS. And basically, um, we wanted to specifically put a lens on exosomes because as many in this audience may know, they're mediators of really near and long distance intercellular communication. And this is both in homeostatic and pathological settings. So they play a very important role in biology. And there are now emerging studies suggesting both the therapeutic ultrasound and other types of oncolytic therapies that extracellular vesicle biology can be influenced. And even the magnitude of extracellular vesicles can be influenced by the application of different types of focal therapies. So to this end, we basically designed a study where we um, plated extracellular vesicles in a dish and we applied focused ultrasound either in a mechanical regime, as you're seeing here, or in a hyperthermia regime. And we basically use different differential ultracentrifugation afterwards to isolate the extracellular vesicles and then asked how the overall um, magnitude of those vesicles changes. And interestingly, across both settings, we observed that there was a significant increase in the overall amount of EVs derived from glioma cells. As an extension of that, we were really interested in understanding whether the profile of those EVs changes in any way. So we took this hyperthermia population and we basically did a broad sweeping approach with mass spec to understand the proteomic profile of EVs. And sure enough, we did see that fuss hyperthermia exposed EVs are proteomically distinct. And I'm just pointing out a few different markers here that are color coded and are reflective of things like cancer progression and resistance, which you can see downregulated as a function of FUS. Um, context for the actual EVs themselves, we also looked at. And finally, markers of inflammation, we also noticed. And this collectively sparked some thinking around whether we can relate any of this work back to some of our immunomodulation uh, profiling that we were doing in vivo in the same model. And so with that, the question became, are these focused ultrasound positive extracellular vesicles capable of bearing any impact on immune activity? And to that end, we did another experiment where we basically assessed cytokine production by immortalized murine dendritic cells following their exposure to these glioma-derived extracellular vesicles. And they were, were, of course, vesicles that were either naive to or exposed to fuss. And we pulsed the dendritic cells with various concentrations of extracellular vesicles to understand the production of a specific cytokine, um, IL-12, uh, IL-12, P70. And IL-12 is a very important player in DC maturation and Th1 differentiation. So that's why we chose it. And just to kind of skip to the punchline here, what we did observe is that there was an increase in normalized IL-12 P70 concentration as a function of exposing those dendritic cells to fuss positive extracellular vesicles. And I'm always happy in the Q&A session to dive into some of our hypotheses for why that might be. Now, with the time we have remaining, I was hoping to step into a separate vignette about delivery of immune adjuvants with focused ultrasound. And I just will preface very quickly this study that we did with immunopet imaging. So basically, we've talked about immunomodulation, but another one of the strengths of focused ultrasound is its ability to potentiate drug delivery. But we have uh, limited ways in which we can actually assess that non-invasively. And so we turn to focus to uh, immunopet imaging as a strategy for being able to spatiotemporally track an immunotherapeutic um, antibody of interest. And in this case, for us, it was CD47. So this is an entirely different study we did targeting a molecule that essentially relays a don't eat me signal when it's upregulated on tumors. And glioblastoma is one of the many different tumors that actually does upregulate CD47, as you can see here. And this basically is a strategy for immune evasion, whereby phagoc phagocytic cell types like macrophages uh, can be inhibited in their uh, activity against the tumor. So basically what we did here was we took uh, an MCD47 antibody, we labeled it with zirconium 89 in order to make it visible on immunopet imaging, and then we assessed two different paradigms. Uh, th and these consisted of basically two different timing schemes 
for the sequence of MCD47 delivery relative to focused ultrasound mediated barrier opening. And basically these images encapsulate in a nutshell what we saw. So these are again, MR images, just reminding you of what a tumor looks like before and after imaging, or I'm sorry, before and after barrier disruption. And consistent with that signature, you can see that before barrier disruption, we had, and this I should say was in a, in a completely separate mouse that just had a GL261 tumor. We basically did not see much signal at all. However, when we open the barrier with one of those um, schemes that I mentioned before, we suddenly see this nice hot region that's in a consistent location with where we targeted. And so while that was a very interesting observation, I think one of the more interesting things to come out of this study and just something that speaks to the power of the role of nuclear medicine in the work that we do is the fact that uh, remember that we assess two different schemes. And interestingly, the first scheme was sort of the dogmatic approach in the field where you take your antibody or your drug of choice and you administer immediately prior to disrupting the barrier. So in that case, that's this green bar. And you can see that actually the green bar didn't depart too significantly from the naive tumor setting or even naive brain uh, in the absence of tumor. However, we see this superlative increase in the, not only in the, 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 um, um, the accumulation of antibody, but also the sustainment of that accumulation over time with the post bus delivery scheme where basically we delivered our antibody about 10 to 15 minutes following disruption of the barrier. So mechanistically, we're very interested in understanding what might be underscoring that difference. But what this study did tell us is that timing of immunotherapy administration relative to BBB opening matters. And it's things like this that we believe are very important for fortifying our combinatorial paradigms going forward. Just one final note about this study was that we also assess tumor outgrowth and survival in our mice. And basically consistent with our observation of greater uh, antibody deposition within the tumors following FUS, we also saw a therapeutic effect when MCD47 was delivered across the barrier with FUS. Just for those who are interested, this was following uh, three repeat administrations of bl blood-brain barrier opening administered at the three time points shown here. Moreover, this translated to an extension and overall survival of these mice. And one important thing that I want to um, denote here is that we actually took these findings and compared them to another study that had been published in the literature recently, where um, that group also used the same exact clone of antibody in GL261 tumors and basically uh, administered two different doses uh, of the antibody in their mice. We chose the lower dose of their administration to compare our work with. And that dose was basically 16 milligrams per kilogram of antibody. The study I'm showing here with focused ultrasound only involved eight milligrams per kilogram of antibody and that only required three doses of antibody in total. But if you do the back of the envelope calculation, we were basically able to achieve the same survival effect that was achieved by the group that I'm referring to here, but with a near 20 fold decrease in the total amount of drug that was administered. And this is incredibly important for the reason that um, many immunotherapies are subject to what we call, and I apologize, this is actually um, flipped here, but basically on target off tumor toxicities, meaning that the antibody is being directed to the correct target, but not necessarily uh, having that toxicity localized to the tumor itself. So one reason we, one way in which we think we could potentially alleviate that, um, in, that toxicity impact is by reducing the overall dose of therapy that's necessary. And so I think this study alludes to the fact that focused ultrasound could be a strategy for potentially doing just that. Uh, and one final anecdote is actually a shift to just demonstrate some of our bench to bedside potential with the work we're doing. And this is in breast cancer. And this is actually much of what my lab focuses on these days. So in breast cancer, we were very interested in actually following the same principles that I laid out in the glioblastoma talk, in that in the early days of the work we were doing, we wanted to understand whether or not we could shift non-inflamed breast cancers to be more inflamed. And in short, our early observations suggested that with the tumor model we were working with, which was 4T1 mammary carcinoma, it was very difficult to elicit a T cell response of any kind with FUS 
in the absence of any other adjuvants. So basically, we turn to an adjuvant known as gemcitabine. So this is a salvage chemotherapy that's often used in maybe third or fourth line care, uh, therapy um, as third or fourth line therapy in breast cancers. But gemcitabine also has this really nice property to it in that it's myeloreductive. When we started to basically immunologically profile our 4T1 tumors, we realized that they were highly burdened with a specific myeloid cell type known as myeloid-derived suppressor cells, or MDSCs. And these, as the name would eponymously suggest, are highly immunosuppressive. So basically, gemcitabine in the context of this study is giving us a strategy by which we can transiently inhibit those MDSCs to hopefully sensitize tumors more favorably to the impact of focused ultrasound. And what we're using here is an ultrasound guided focused ultrasound system. And uh, we're performing partial thermal ablation, which I believe I explained a bit about at the start of this talk. So just to summarize our findings, we administered a variety of different therapy, a variety of different approaches here. You're looking at sham treatment as well as monotherapy treatments with FUS and gemcitabine. But hopefully what you can appreciate not only from our outgrowth data, but also the survival data is that um, the combinatorial therapy performed the best in terms of constraining tumor outgrowth and extending survival. Given that our survival in these mice was mainly underscored by uh, a, um, a slower rate of onset of pulmonary metastases, we were interested in determining whether there was any adaptive immune component underscoring these observations. And so the rest of the findings that I'm showing here have to do with basically decoupling what the impact of focused ultrasound and gemcitabine might be on the adaptive immune system. And so this study, we basically repeat, we applied our therapies in the context of RAG1 knockout mice. These are mice that lack um, uh, T and B cells. So they basically lack an adaptive, uh, mature adaptive immune system. And sure enough, you can see that we lose our protection when in the absence of those cell types. So these are the two purple bars shown here. And additionally, given that we were only able to stratify whether T and B cells were involved, we further wanted to probe the impact of T cells specifically in the context of this paradigm. And so what you're seeing here is a separate antibody depletion experiment where we depleted CD4 and CD8 T cells to again see that the protective effect as denoted by the yellow arrow here is lost in the absence of those T cells. So taken together, this gave us uh, some preface to actually pursue the translation of this work into a clinical trial. And so I'm really happy to share that there's now an ongoing clinical trial at UVA that is assessing focused ultrasound in combination with gemcitabine in breast cancer patients. And again, while I only had a brief moment to summarize this work, it is published in the Journal for Immunotherapy of Cancer. And I'm more than happy to discuss the nuances of this trial as well. Uh, just to summarize briefly what I discussed today, I'd like to share again that focused ultrasound, for those who are unfamiliar, I hope I've at least convinced you that it is a versatile emerging technology poised to play a transformative role in cancer immunotherapy. And we've discovered that focused ultrasound can augment the release of extracellular vesicles, and this further gives way to vesicles with unique profiles. And my lab is interested in probing that further as we move forward with our work. Focused ultrasound-mediated barrier disruption is not immunologically quiescent, and this, of course, holds critical implications for ongoing translation of this approach. Focused ultrasound can mediate immunotherapy delivery across the glioma-associated barriers and control gliomas with marked reduction in therapeutic antibody dose. Uh, immunoimaging is a powerful tool for informing FUS-mediated paradigms. And finally, the combination of FUS with systemic myeloreductive chemotherapy may actually be able to sensitize uh, breast cancer tumors uh, in a manner that would then render them more amenable to immunotherapy, which is again something that my lab is now exploring in greater detail. And so there remain many burning questions for our field, and I just wanted to share these last couple slides as a segue into you know, the, the discussion within this working group. I think from the standpoint of basic science, you know, there were a lot of themes that I touched on, but certainly merit, they merit depth in their own right. So, you know, further understanding the mechanistic underpinnings of how we are cueing different changes in the immunological sequelae with sound waves.
is obviously very important. And also we haven't necessarily delved as a group yet into the role of the vasculature and, and the lymphatics and how fuss in turn can impact those things in the context of what we're seeing. And again, we only really scratched the surface with that, that initial in vitro study we did looking at extracellular vesicle profile and biology, but I think that's given way to a pillar in my lab, which is going to be really important going forward. And finally, we've looked at breast cancer and glioma, but by no stretch is that um, is that um, is our work limited to those spaces. So there are a lot of diverse tumor pathologies and further considerations to make in that regard as well. And finally, something that really motivated me to think about the makeup of my lab and the work we'll do going forward is this bin that I'm showing here for translation, where there are things like dose and sequencing and prediction of performance of therapies that still uh, are, I think, necessary for our field, but of course, for the field of cancer immunotherapy in general. And our lab is sort of taking this approach to kind of incorporating some of those questions into our work going forward. So this is my final slide. And I just want to say, you know, this my lab is really centered on ushering focused ultrasound into the era of precision immuno-oncology. And to that end, we're not only interested in understanding immunomodulation and drug delivery, and I believe that going forward, these are gonna require more unbiased systematic approaches as we find with systems biology and immunology. But we're also interested in now translating some of those things to look at the circulome specifically. So thinking about how focused ultrasound can benefit from the use of liquid biopsy as a tool but also uh, our EV work and other work in the field points to the fact that focused ultrasound may actually be in turn a tool for potentiating liquid biopsy. And we're interested in exploring that as well. And finally, uh, we do a lot of advanced quantitative imaging as you probably saw me allude to today. We're interested in becoming more systematic about the way that we collect these images in the hopes that this would uh, lend well to imaging informatics approaches and the discovery of non-invasive radiographic biomarkers going forward as well. So with that, I just wanna thank you all for the attention and uh, for your attention and for the invitation to speak with this group today. And of course, I'd like to thank our lab and all of our collaborators and funding sources for making this work possible. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. That was exciting. And I'll open it up to questions. As always, I have a few, but I let people <laughs> start. Lorenzo, you're a vascular biologist. Yes. Oh, uh, I... I thought I would left that one uh, out, but uh, now that you call it is all right. You mentioned uh, that you open the vasculature uh, when you apply the ultrasound, right? So in the constant, uh, context of glioma, that might be good because uh, blood brain barrier, you open it. Uh, right. you, you put some note on um, mm, uh, melanoma, which is the kind of tumor where you, is a, it tends to metastasize, right? It, it, uh, it's a little bit uh, evil in this sense. So if you open the vascular, to, you might think, some might think that while you do good things, perhaps promote immunotherapy, et cetera, you also favor metastasis. Is there something, uh, some ideas in that arena? You know, it is, it is an age old question and it's a great one that you're asking. And it's honestly a question that I've gotten many times. I think there are very few studies in our field, if any, that I can think of offhand that have done this characterization outright. And it is actually one of the foremost motivations of my lab right now is to actually do that characterization of circulating tumor cells specifically and understand the linkage between exosomes and circulating tumor cells and the prospect of metastasis. I will say empirically the data that we're seeing in the field and the data we've collected both preclinically and clinically does not suggest that focused ultrasound in any of the varieties I mentioned is lending to an increase in metastasis. So while I think that's a good sign, I, I do feel that we're better served by having concrete data that is, is directed towards that specific hypothesis. So especially in the periphery, this is a really important question. And, and certainly my lab is not only doing work with 
intracranial tumors, but also extracranial tumors. Um, but, you know, to your point about glioma versus melanoma, I think one of the nice things about us having started in glioma is just the fact that this is less of a question, of course, when it comes to like a primary brain tumor setting, we're less concerned about that risk. So I hope that answers your question. And, you know, perhaps in the future, we can put some work out there to, to address it more directly. Well, the other that I have is, um, is I'm amazed by the potential, even from the surgical perspective. So in the hand of a skilled surgeon, how far can he go in the ablative uh, thing? How, how much can he use it as a surgical tool? And, uh, and perhaps, uh, well, how precise it is, uh, uh, this kind of consideration, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think all of that, like those kinds of questions, it comes down to the design of our systems and, and how we're deploying them in terms of, uh, you know, the setting that we're deploying them in. So a lot of the, the question around how precise we want to be and how we deploy things comes down to the makeup of our acoustic exposure conditions, which is why I probably overemphasize that thinking I'm talking to more of a, a physics crowd because usually that's where the conversation comes in about what we're doing to the tissue. But, you know, to your point, I think most, for instance, neurosurgeons that I talk to these days are pretty confident that we can treat any volume ranging from roughly, say, a grain of rice to about a grapefruit, just to liken it to kind of familiar volumes, uh, and, and within relatively any region in the brain. I mean, I hope I'm not overstating that, but I think our systems have brought us quite far, especially in the brain setting. And then in the periphery, there are also different systems that are uniquely designed to be able to overcome the hurdles of certain uh, of targeting uh, of certain types of anatomy. That's amazing. You could do in the future uh, repetitive microsurgeries where you just take a little bit out uh, at the time, but you don't cause this massive inflammation due to surgery and, okay, bleeding and everything. So That's correct. And Yeah, thank you. And, and I think that's the very exciting prospect. Like, again, I didn't get to really talk about the clinical systems and, and what's going on in that realm, but exactly what you described is happening presently. So for instance, with blood brain barrier opening, many of the clinical trials that are open are doing repeat barrier opening on the order of, you know, several weeks for these patients. And to my knowledge, it sort of happens on, on a relatively outpatient like procedure. So it's not this incredibly invasive and, and, you know, consuming process as you were alluding to with um, traditional surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I guess I can go ahead. I think there are other people maybe who have a few, but something to change the subject a little bit. One of the things we were hearing about a few weeks ago was Tanova talking about long COVID. And his theoretical understanding of long COVID based on his experiments in hamsters is that it is a chronic hyperinflammatory response in the brain. And his problem is that he can't get immunomodulators into the brain uh, to be able to affect that uh, hyperinflammatory response. Uh, the best they could do is do a vaccination. Sometimes that somehow magically resets the inflammatory state of the brain, but it's unreliable. And it struck me that the kind of stimulated inflammatory response followed by shutdown, because you seem to see controlled shutdown. You don't see extended inflammation plus permeabilization if you could map the timings well, might potentially be a very, very effective way of dealing with some of the problems that he's finding are intractable at the moment in long COVID. So it's changing the direction completely from the cancer one, uh, but uh, potentially it's the, several of the things you were talking about could have therapeutic value there potentially as well. I wondered if that's something you thought about or others are thinking about in this context. 
Well, if I can just comment to say, you know, I really appreciate the that thought and, and the fact that you're suggesting this. In fact, it's exactly why I'm here, because while we're in the cancer realm, we're very interested and being able to branch out and by no means are, are, you know, constrained to that space. So what I had failed to realize is that this intractable problem exists in long COVID. So that actually is really illuminating. And I think anytime there is a, a permeability challenge as relates to the CNS, it's a pretty low barrier to entry for focused ultrasound. I, I say that, you know, obviously skipping all the challenges of making the thing work. But, you know, if he has a model, for instance, of long COVID and you said hamsters, um, then that's about on the on the order in terms of uh, scale of animal that our preclinical systems can handle. It's it's right on par with, you know, what we could very easily do barrier opening in with our um, preclinical systems. But it's I mean, it's possible that you wouldn't even need the immunomodulator. That the that the, the inflammatory stimulus that you're providing might be enough if you were lucky to shut down the pathological inflammation that they're seeing. Of course, you could do both. So to me, That's the right. fact that that, that 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 you have an immune stimulation by itself, plus you have the ability to drug do drug delivery, uh, was particularly interesting. And your your study about the time window, which you only alluded to. Uh, mm -hmm the short time uh, would be fascinating to understand more about the sort of the time scale over which you see these responses. Oh, I, I completely agree. And, you know, again, it's interesting because we're only starting to scratch the surface as far as how these, uh, you know, to your point about control and predictability, we're only starting to scratch the surface as to how robust these effects are and how they translate across different pathologies. So I would actually be really curious to know, taken outside the scope of cancer, how these same types of ex acoustic exposure conditions would influence inflammation in a different setting. And I think, again, you know, if I were to play devil's advocate a little bit, I would think of it um, from the immunomodulation standpoint, again, about that, the reproducibility and the sort of controlled nature within which we could exert that response. But assuming that could happen, then it unlocks a really interesting potential to either use that as a tool alone or in conjunction with drug delivery, which, you know, can, can certainly happen in the same uh, scope of, of treatment. So this is just something I, I had not given thought to. In fact, I think a lot of us with the onset of the pandemic were thinking about ways that focused ultrasound could potentially interface with, you know, uh, COVID treatment. And I honestly have not seen much with the exception of maybe one or two papers in the literature to that end. So, yeah. I mean, another, another place, again, maybe not the most effective way to do it or or, or efficient, but which we've had some talks on was was adjuvants in the context of, of vaccines. Mm -hmm. And exactly how adjuvants work, of course, is a bit mysterious. Presumably, a big function is exciting innate immune response, inflammatory response in the lymph nodes to change the way lymph nodes respond to antigen presentation. And we heard some a good talk for, uh, over a year ago about specifically what's happening in lymph nodes during that kind of excitation. Mm. And, and again, uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's using a, a sledgehammer to, to crack a walnut, but you could imagine perhaps doing, instead of a, a chemical or particulate adjuvant, to do uh, a focused ultrasound adjuvant targeted on the lymph nodes to presensitize mm -hmm. them. Uh, and use that in conjunction with vaccine to do to, to increase vaccine efficacy. Again, the time windows and the details might be complicated, uh, but it might give you much better control than putting these sort of ill-defined particulate adjuvants into vaccines. Uh, and and uh, I think I think permeabilization wound up, winds up being very important in the context of antigen presentation. Uh, and so it might be it might be uh, another area where where this kind of approach could be used. I don't know if anybody else had that thought hearing this talk, but uh, to me that was uh, 
definitely something that uh, it reminded me of. Well, again, I, um, I just want to say I really appreciate that suggestion as well. And it is, again, it's very interesting in that this has come up for us on more than one occasion, the idea of sonicating lymph nodes or basically trying to create a, a um, locally administered adjuvant, right? Like an auto vaccine alternative to our traditional adjuvants, especially in light of the fact that those are systemically administered, whereas focused ultrasound could be administered in a targeted manner. Um, so I will, uh, quite honestly, I think one of our constraints in doing that right now is just the technical limits on our ability to treat a mouse lymph node, for instance, with focused ultrasound. But, you know, barring that technical limitation, I think there's, again, just so much interesting potential there. And I appreciate you uh, bringing this up because it's, it's a very timely topic that you're raising. No, I mean, it's a technology that has almost limitless potential. And well, I'm very biased. <laughs> so I appreciate hearing that from someone else, <laughs> but... Yeah, we, I, I, I was hopeful that, you know, this talk would at least convey that much. I mean, really, it's, it's such a versatile technology, and we're just in this era of uh, understanding all the nuances of the way biology is influenced by focused ultrasound. I mean, it really originated as a technology for thermally ablating tissues, and now you see where we are. And I think that, again, just hearkening back to what I was saying at the outset of the talk, um, that's why I'm thinking a lot more these days about the way the dawn of data science is going to emerge in our field, because we're seeing a lot more of these this bio level uh, characterization methods taking place. And those will, of course, in turn lend potentially to more multi-scale modeling approaches and just the convergence of what we can now garner from advanced imaging compared to just years ago along with where you know, our um, high dimensional profiling techniques are, I think just creates a really interesting uh, grounds for interrogating what focused ultrasound can do. I'm sorry that one of our regulars, Gary Ann, is in surgery today, so he's not oh. on the call. And, but he, he has a very single-minded focus on, on therapy. Oh, but he typically great. talks about therapy from the point of view of drugs, because, of course, most of the time when you think about therapeutics, drugs are the thing if it's not a surgical intervention. And so this opens up a whole window on very interesting combination therapies that, that involve a, a mechanical a component. And I think, I think uh, all of us need to think more seriously about that, the potential role of this kind of approach. I'm always saying to Gary, when we talk about it, you know, drugs aren't the only kind of therapy. <laughs> and it's ironic, given that he's a surgeon, that he's so fixated on, 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 on drugs as a therapy. But of course, most therapies are drug-based. And so I think that this was really, I hope, eye-opening for our participants. And, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, we do get a lot of viewers on the recording. So Wonderful. You know, I hope... I hope uh, I'm sure Gary will be able to watch this when he's when he has uh, when he has the out of out of <laughs> the time. So, I, are there any last comments or questions? Where well, we've run over our 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 allotted time. Thank you so much for the incredibly stimulating presentation. I know our previous speaker had to leave early, but I'll thank him anyway for his great presentation. You never know how these things will work together. I think actually they were both very intriguing because they were extending our regular thinking about, we, we'd have a tendency to think about cytokines, infection, and, and, and immune cells. And, and both of the talks were pushing us to think more broadly about what the immune system is and how you regulate it. And so uh, I, I thank you both for, for coming and I hope you'll both come back again uh, and speak to us again as your work develops, maybe dig into some of the details of one or two of these many topics. So with that, I'll draw the meeting to a close. Thank you again. Thank you so much.